welcome to a Buzzwords and Poets Books presentation. We are honored to have you here. You could have been anywhere on this Sunday evening and chose to spend time with us. And we do not take that for granted at all. I just want to make an announcement. There is a back window open for your safety and for your comfort. If you do get a little too overwhelmed by the heat, please let anyone know with the Bus Boys and Boys shirt on and we'll be sure to take care of your knees. We don't want anyone to get too overwhelmed, but we did want that open and fresh air to continue to come through the room. I also ask that you silence your phones at this time. Please turn off your flash. Photography and videography are encouraged throughout the program, but we just ask that you turn off that flash now or if you notice that it's on when you start using your cameras. We have five amazing servers throughout the space. We can go ahead and give them a preliminary round of applause because they're going to be able to take care of all of you tonight. If you're just walking in, we are conducting a raffle, so if you have not received a ticket, please come see us at the Bus Boys and Poets books table, and we'll be sure to get it for you. It's the 40th anniversary of Migrations of the Heart. Congratulations, Ms. Maria. And she has blessed us with a nice signed copy, so please be sure to get your raffle, and please hold on to your ticket for those who already did get their raffle ticket. Now, we have Ms. Pamela Wol Wolford here tonight. She is an interdisciplinary artist creating new forms of narrative work about black women and girls and others who joy, imagination, and inner life are underexplored in American media and popular art. She is the recipient of six Maryland State Council Art, or Ms. Council Art, Council Awards, five film festival awards internationally, a Change Maker Challenge Award. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay, perfect a Change Maker Challenge Award from United Way of Central Maryland and Horizon Foundation, two Baker Artist Awards in Interdisciplinary Arts and an AC Fund Micro Grant and a host of other honors. She has been awarded a Story Night Writers Residency, an NES Artist Residency, and an official citation from the Berlin House of Delegates. So we have any artists, I mean, any artists, any writers, any photographers in the house, you are definitely in the space and in the room with the right individual, so please be sure to say hello if you see her. Miss <laughs> Wolford's multimedia installation, Antoine and Me, exhibited at the Baltimore Museum of Art during 2002 and 2003, and the show voted one of the top five exhibitions in the Baltimore area during the show's opening year by Be More Art Magazine. Her latest film, Interrupted, Prologue to a Mem Noir, had a limited online release with a virtual premiere event co-sponsored by Bus Boys and Poets and attended by 1.5 thousand people. Let's just 1.5 thousand people. Sorry, I didn't even get the full set. <laughs> Ms. Wolford has authored more than 100 memoir, fiction, profile, human interest, and think pieces published in the Baltimore Sun, Poets and Writers Magazine, NAACP Crisis Magazine, Harvard University Transition, and other publications. Her writings have been selected for anthology, translating into German and widely cited. She has been the Bison Lecturer in the Humanities at Miramar University. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Miss Pamela, and she's going to be introduced. Be sure to introduce Ms. Maria herself. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I have the profound pleasure to introduce um, and interview Marina Dolphin on the stage tonight. And following the interview, there'll be an opportunity for you all to ask questions of Marina, and then she will also do a book signing as well. Um, Marina and I are friends. Uh, I should say that first. And we came to be friends through Marita's uh, workshops and events. And um, I just want to say thank you, Marita, for the fact that I okay. have. I think you can hold the microphone in your head, it might be easier. I'll just stay closer to it. There you go. It is good. Okay. Right yeah. That I am part of a supportive and expansive um, literary community of black women. Um, through knowing you. Um, Maria Golden 
is a veteran teacher of writing and an acclaimed multi-award winning author of over 20 works of fiction, non-fiction, and anthologies. She has been a faculty member at Creative Writing Master's programs at George Mason University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Johns Hopkins University, and lectured and spoken at over 80 colleges and universities throughout the United States, and at universities in Israel, Turkey, and Spain. She is the recipient of the Poets and Writers Barnes and Noble Writers for Writers Award, the Authors Guild Award for Distinguished Service for the, to the Literary Community, and the Award for Fiction from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She has been an NPR Best Book Author, a two-time NAACP Image Award nominee, and inducted into the International Literary Hall of Fame of Writers of African Descent. All right. And Marita Golden is the co-founder of the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation. Tonight, we are here to speak on the occasion of the recent release of Marita's latest book, The New Black Woman Loves Herself, Has Boundaries, and Heals Every Day. And because we're here talking about growth, um, and inner growth for the sake of self, Marita, let's talk about your own personal growth, because I know that um, it's a very important um, anniversary, the 40th anniversary of your very first book, which was a memoir, Migrations of the Heart. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> uh, I woke up at the end of last year and said, oh my goodness, next year is the 40th anniversary of the publication of My Gracious of Heart. Stop, we need to celebrate that. Now, I don't know what my publishers are gonna do, but I'm celebrating that. And, uh, I really feel blessed to have been called to write, to have been called to keep writing, to have been called to be a literary activist, and through the DNA that's in my blood, create so many communities of support for black writers. The Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation is celebrating 33 years this year. The Legacy Awards Ceremony, which is the Oscars of Black Writing, will be held at the Lincoln Theater in October. So if you're not on the HurstonWright.org list, you need to get on that list. <laughs> so you will be where you need to be on October 17th. Um, to have written, edited, so much fiction and nonfiction is very meaningful. Um, I don't know how I would have understood my life if not for writing, because I've written so many different memoirs, and it's healed me, it's helped me, um, I lost my mother when I was 21, my father when I was 23, and through my writing, through virtually everything I write, I'm reclaiming them. And so in the workshops that I do, uh, whether they are writing as healing, whether they're memoir, whether they're fiction, we're talking about healing in one way, one way or another. So um, I'm a person who, I don't wait for people to give me my flowers. I go out and pick them. Oh, I love that. You know, I just like want to take a moment to talk about migrations of the heart because in that you discuss um, so much of your uh, your coming into your own in terms of um, self care, and you, you, you talk about like where you came from, and I think that's very important that we that we own our our full story. And mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my, I have these great parents. I grew up in Washington, D.C. in Columbia Heights, before it was Columbia Heights. <laughs> and uh, my father was a great storyteller. He was Afrocentric before we used that term, and my bedtime stories were about Cleopatra and Hannibal and Sojourner Truth. And my mother told me when I was 12 years old that I was going to write a book one day. So these people were conspiring to make me a writer. And so, of course, I was devastated 
when they died before they got to see me become a quote, real writer, you know, so they could really publish. But from their early deaths, I took the message of how important self-care is and vowed that I was gonna live long enough to see my grandchildren. And I just thought, I'm gonna be a grandma again. No. <laughs> um, I have a blended family, so I have my husband, um, three grand grandchildren, and then from my son, a two and a half year old, and another one coming in December. And when my son told me that, I really felt so blessed um, to have my dream come true. One of my dreams was to live long enough to see my grandchildren. And one of my other dreams was to be a writer. And before we go any further, I just want to say that I, this is the first time I've ever been to this particular bus boys and poets. And I want to thank Andy Shalal for redefining the meaning of gentrification. Um, when he first opened the first bus boys in DC, the gentrification cycle had just started. And he made it his goal to redefine gentrification from separation to unity. And so I just think what he's done in the DMV is so, so important. And I always love coming out to Plus Boys. Really do. Let's get out of here. I mean, he just got me proud of Mount Everest. And just told me and my husband, he's going back again. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, before Pam and I start our conversation, I want to just give you a little taste of the book. Um, well, you I, know, before we get yeah, to that, Marina, I, I just want to talk just for a quick second about where this book is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because I know prior to this book, your last book, which you um, wrote and released during the pandemic, uh, entitled The Strong Black Woman A Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. So, will you let uh, us know just a little bit about how that book came about and how that book was received? Just yeah, question. so what I've done is I found myself writing a two book curriculum, <laughs> a syllabus for radical self care. Okay, now I didn't plan to do this, but just before the pandemic started, the lockdown, I had kind of a physical episode where I thought I was having a stroke. I was having a stroke. Mm -hmm. Found out through an MRI that I had had, sometime in the distant past, two silent strokes. Now, my mother died of a stroke, my father died of a heart attack. So that's in my gene pool. But because I vowed to be really healthy, and early on got into watching my diet, walking, meditating, going to a therapist when I needed, those strokes, which I could not help because they were in my gene pool, were silent strokes. They were not debilitating strokes. And so I got to thinking about my health and then went home because I'm a storyteller. I said, there's a story here somewhere, somewhere in the story. And I found that there was a very vibrant, muscular, serious conversation going on about black women in health, black women and the strong black woman complex, and what came out of COVID is increasing awareness of the importance of talking about, thinking about our bodies and, and, and self-care. So in that book, I uh, interviewed doctors, therapists, and I also interviewed a lot of black women. I wanted them to talk about how they hurt and how they heal. I wanted them to talk about going to therapy and coming out of therapy to destigmatize therapy. And um, so, I, I even one of my favorite chapters in that book is where I reimagine if Fanny Hamer and Rosa Parks and Harriet Tubman could talk about their pain, not just their victories and their strength, but if we had created a space where they could talk about their pain. So it's a it's a multi. Um, faceted book, journalism, essay, little memoir. So then people love the book and they say, but Marina, um, what do you do? What are your practices? So I said, okay, I can write that very easily. And so this is the result. And um, it's a little book that is half inspiration, half guidebook. 
It's a perfect book for those of you men, and I love that men have emailed me, I love this book. So that it's a book for anyone who wants to start a practice of self-care. And so the first part, I'm gonna read a couple passages from that, and in the last part, there's all these resources. I can't find anybody to walk with. Give me a good book. Where's it a film? Where's an online community? Where's an in-person community? It's all in here. So, um, and I just want to acknowledge um, that we have another person in the audience today. Michelle Pettis, will you stand up? Big hair. <laughs> Michelle Pettis is a good friend of mine. She was in one of my writing workshops, and she's written a wonderful book called Leaving Large, Stories of a Food Addict. A wonderful book about her journey, her lifelong journey to health and well-being and the ways in which ill health is often a story in our head. So um, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from The New Black Woman, and then we can have a conversation. I begin this book by writing about silence because I believe reconciliation with the beauty and power of our souls is the foundation for all the good we do in our lives and the world. Silence as we meditate, silence as we pray, silence during long walks, silence while sitting, silence just because. In silence, we connect with our intuition, our inner wisdom, and the expansiveness of our hearts. And when we do that, we can set boundaries, and we can care for our bodies and minds with compassion and dedication. And I started meditating, doing transcendental meditation when I was in my 20s. And over the years, I've felt a uh, pretty regular practice of either going to a retreat to be silent or waking up in the morning telling my husband, I'm not talking today. And he'll say, <laughs> <laughs> For Christmas, he gave me two days in a hotel so I could be silent. And these years of silence, you don't have to go to the top of a mountain. You don't have to go to Lululemon and buy a yoga mat. You can be silent anywhere, anytime. Start with one minute, start with two minutes. It is, it is life saving. In the book I talk about um, boundaries. Black women are stereotyped is never at a loss for words. It's being women who always have something to say. It's saying what we want to say, whether others want to hear it or not. But are we saying what we need to say? Are we saying what we want to say? Language could be a shield, a preemptive strike, or a purposeful misdirection. If we are expected to always be strong, we may feel we must always be right. And right then becomes what others say it is or what others need right to be. Our families often censor what we can express and how honest we can be. Our jobs require we present and show up in prescribed ways. If we're trapped in a toxic love relationship, we can find ourselves performing in exchange for what only sporadically feels like love. And who dare speak our truth in these situations, all that we hold dear, acceptance, respect, and affection may be on the line. Um, my favorite therapist is a woman named Dr. Arthur Chapman, by some of you in the room who are a little older may know. And um, she's responsible for helping me to get healthy enough to bring my partner, friend, and soulmate of 33 years into my life. And she says, loving yourself is the very first thing. Love yourself, take care of yourself. Many of the women who come to see me were never taken care of by their mothers, so they have no idea how to mother themselves. That means they're clueless about how to set boundaries. They may have had to parent other younger siblings starting at a young age and mother others, but would never mother themselves. Many women will need therapy to learn how to set boundaries. Black women are told that their grandmothers and mothers didn't complain, bore every weight, and solved every problem, and so they have to carry on that tradition. Black women have the right to set limits. You don't have to always be the first responder in any crisis. And 
the third part of the book, um, before the resources, is about our bodies. And um, these magnificent things that we walk around in and dream in and sleep in, uh, just magnificent. And um, caring for them is one of the most important things we can ever do. And black women are in a health emergency. We've been in a health emergency ever since we were brought to these shores. We lead in deaths percentage-wise related to obesity causes, heart attacks, stroke, diabetes, and stress kills. So much of this can be handled. We can't dismantle systemic racism, but we can take a breath. Yes, yes. We can yes. say no. Mm -hmm. We can say, do it your damn self. Mm -hmm. you know, we can say, did you hear what I said? I said no, okay? And that, when I asked therapists, what's the one thing that black women could do? They said, sit down, be still. And when I asked the cardiologist, she said, move. <laughs> But she didn't mean move like brrrr. She meant move in terms of moving your body in intentional ways that are designed to give it rest, relaxation, and energy. I mean, my practice of, of, of moving my body has recently evolved to doing not only Pilates yoga walking, but Qigong. And I do that because my body's involved into a new set of challenges. And Qigong helps me deal with that. Um, heart disease is a leading cause of death in America. It is the leading cause of death for black women. The definition of a strong black woman is a woman who gives her heart away. She gives her heart away and has nothing in return. She gives her heart to others and feels no sense of depletion or buries anger when her request for heart-inspired support are rejected or ignored. The traditional old-school strong black woman tells herself that is the price of being loved and needed. But we need to think about our hearts as though they were newborn babies we're holding in our arms. A bouquet we have not expected, or the feel of the hand of someone we love who loves us. We must cherish our hearts because they are and symbolize our center, our core. We must care for our hearts, make them strong, and give our hearts metaphorically and literally only to those who will cherish them as we do. So I like, just want to like go through the book um, section by section for a second, and, and, and go back to that first section, which is um, embracing silence as self-care. And um, I want to read a quote from that section because there's something so important that you say at the end of um, this particular quote on page uh, well, I'll pull it up from 36. And it was really quite powerful when I read it. Um, and it's also a really good introduction to what we're talking about. So, you're a single mother, a woman working three jobs, a stressed out executive, or a woman in a relationship with a partner who you feel neither recognizes nor supports your deepest emotional needs. Or you're just feeling increasingly overwhelmed. It's time to get real. It's time to get honest first with yourself and then with others once you recognize that you need downtime, me time, quiet time. Share that with those closest to you. This is not an admission of weakness or failure, but the first step in becoming more healthy, more loving of yourself and others, and in all the ways that matter to you more powerful. Let all these folks know that this is your new project, a project that you need their support to complete, and you complete it every day. 
This is a joy project, a life-saving project. They don't have to understand you, just support you. And this is the statement that feels from me. And if they can't support you, you can be all the support you need. And I just thought this really so profound to remind me. Well, the thing about silence is that um, I have this very deep and abiding relationship with my inner Maria. Mm -hmm. And she speaks to me in silence. Um, if I'm praying, I'm asking for something. You know, more money on my next advance, or please, God, get my daughter the help she feel you. But when I'm silent, I'm listening and I'm open. And I'm also humble. And it and this tradition of silence is so old, it's ancient, you know, all the major spiritual and religious traditions embed silence as part of the major practices. But we live in a world that has demonized silence, that has made silence, you know, almost like illegitimate or illegal. And so you don't have to go out and find it, you just have to reclaim it. And I think that in all of those hours and hours of silence, my inner Marita has said, you know, you can do better. Yes, you can. Okay, I'm not gonna judge you, you're afraid, but we'll deal with this. There's some issues I've had where only a therapist can help me unpack. Only a therapist, only one of the best therapists out there helped me understand why in terms of boundaries, I had no boundaries against men who brought misery into my life. <laughs> and huge boundaries against anybody who looked like they were gonna make me happy. <laughs> Only a therapist can help me figure out why a successful writer of so many books and was so stupid in her emotional life because I was in so much pain around my, my parents' death. But then there's other things that I've dealt with where my inner Marita knew and she told me, and just by listening to her going in the silence. Some days I'll wake up and I'm not on a mountaintop, I'm not in a retreat, I'm not in a hotel room, but that's gonna be a day of an intentional quiet. I'm in my car, I'm shopping at Wetlands, mm -hmm. but in my mind, in my spirit, I'm, I'm on low, I'm on low. So there are many ways to be silent, and this thing of telling our families is very important. You know, how do I say no, say it. Say it. Um, the world will not fall apart. Your family will not disown you. I mean, they'll get, they may get mad, and there's a million ways to say no. But the first thing you have to believe is not so much saying it, it's believe that you deserve to say no. What will I do with all this time if I say no to them and yes to myself? Well, if I'm afraid to hear my inner demons, I don't want to say no. I was like, keep busy, keep busy. So that's where you may need professional support. And usually we have very wise women in our friendship network who are doing the things that we want to do. And we never think to ask them, how do you say no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, just I mean that feeds into like the second part of the book, which is say was it uh, say hello to yourself. And um, like you, you, you've already touched on that. Like when you go into that assignment, you really um, hone in on developing more of your own intuition, so that you can really help yourself. Um, and and I'm my best friend. My husband's my second. <laughs> <laughs> And he has no problem with, you know, my going off to be silent. And, you know, once I started listening to myself, I'm really smart. <laughs> Real smart. Yeah. But I have to listen to this stuff that's in here. Everything doesn't come from a book. Yeah, and the silence helps us to, to get rid of all those other messages. Yes, yeah. yeah. And that's, so the third uh, section is called, is 
no is not a bad word, but you've already touched yeah. on as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but we but talk I do about- wanna, I do want to read one other section. Sure. This is about silence um, and how silence, you know, can heal. And because I'm a storyteller and I love literature, I like to write about literature. And then in The Strong Black Woman, I wrote about Jane Crawford, the heroine of Their Eyes Are Watching God, and how, oh my God, I realized Jane Crawford was a new black woman. I never realized that. But of course she was, because she worked her way into joy and into trusting her instincts and her voice. And so when I came to the back of the book and I was looking for, you know, models in black literature, she was one of the first. And in this book I talk about two others, two of the most beloved and cherished heroines, heroes of the canon of literature that African American women's writers have created are stealing and Alice Walker's award-winning novel, The Color Purple, and Maya Angelou in her memoir, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. In The Color Purple, 14-year-old Celie is a victim of rape, poverty, sexism, and racism. A poor black girl who's been ground into the dust of self-hatred and fear. But Celie, but while Celie is repeatedly told no in the novel, she chills, chisels her way into a resounding yes for herself, her life, and her ability to love. And I know why the cage bird sings. After she was raped at the age of eight by her mother's boyfriend, Maya told her family what had happened to her. The man was arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed for one day. When he was released from prison, her uncles beat the man to death. For the next six years, Maya was mute. Angela wrote that she had come to believe that her words and her voice had killed a man. I've also long believed that Maya, as a victim of rape, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, guilt, and shame, stopped speaking to say yes to herself. She chose silence to heal, nurse, and nurture her battered soul. The adults around her could not protect her from sexual molestation. Likely had no words to reach her battered soul. And then in an act that the community saw as just, ensnared Maya in the taking of the life of a man. How would, how could Maya find words to speak to anyone but her beloved brother Bailey? with whom she periodically shared her deepest feelings. In her silence, selected, chosen, and imposed, Maya said yes to herself and no to those who, had, even though they loved her, had been unable to keep her safe. Her silence was a loud yes. There are times when silence is a powerful form of speech. Maya was hoarding her strength living a life of her mind and feelings, and putting herself back together again, saying yes to herself only. Mm. Thank you. So we've been talking about like silence and going inward, and um, somehow, sometimes to allow ourselves to do that, we need to set boundaries. And that's what you discuss in the third section of the book. And so I just wanted to ask you when you talk about the importance of setting boundaries and the messages we have to overcome sometimes to set those boundaries. And also, the very important fact that you bring up that sometimes saying no can actually be empowering to the person you say no to. Yes. We need to empower people to solve their own problems, particularly our children and family members. Um, black women have a very conflicted relationship with yes and no. Constantly saying yes makes us feel loved, needed, respected. 
outside in the world, that world, we're dumped on. We're, you know, we're marginalized. Oh, in the family, we're big mama. We're, you know, we're the ATM machine. We're the therapist. We're the priest. And we take on those, those jobs as a way to say, I matter. But really mattering, you don't have to do that because you know you matter no matter what you're doing. Right. And too many families have strong black women who are killing themselves, dying slowly, and weak children. Weak children who don't know how to solve their own problems. So instead of you coming to me for the 14th time, Grandma, I need some money. You know what, let's have a sit down conversation about money. Yeah. Let's see if I can show you how to do a budget, how to solve this problem, how to look for a job. Because I don't need to be your problem solver because I know I'm bad, okay? I, I, know, I, I, I know I got it going on. So I don't need you to affirm me, you know. So I mean, sometimes, sometimes you have to teach them the fish. Yes, yeah. teach them the fish. Yeah. You learn the fish, teach them the fish. So the fourth and the final part of the book, um, The New Black Woman, is my body, myself. In that section, you discuss the dangers of the mind-body disconnect caused by the myth of the strong black woman that we've been given messages telling us that we must be strong and in charge and we have no time for weakness. And those messages actually sabotage our own health. Yeah, when I was talking to one of the most um, a black women who works at Washington Hospital Center and is a cardiologist and she said all the time, she said, look, I want black women to come in, even if they're late, come in, come in to see me. But typically, they will take their kids to the emergency room with the first sign of anything. They will, will live with a stroke coming on for a week and argue with you when you want to take them to the emergency room because they have something to do. And many black women are really disconnected and they shut their bodies off and they shut their bodies down and they do not know how to hear their bodies. But that gets, that gets, gets back again to, do you deserve, do you feel you deserve to take care of your body? Maybe you don't. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Sometimes you there's, see? there's so many outside narratives. Yes, yes, them. yes. You're important, but are you important enough to be healthy? Right. And I've surrounded myself ever since you know, I became an adult with what I call sister circles. You know, when I was working at white universities and, you know, dealing with a particular brand of white liberal racism at, you know, in college, I found every black female professor I could on that campus said, look, we don't get together once a month. They never thought I was crazy. And that was my sister circle at the university. Uh, when I was a single mother, um, and I, this is the other thing I say in the book, I think I say this in the book, that many times people will think, you know, this, this conversation is only for middle class or upper class people, but it's not, it's for everybody. And when I was a working class, harried, insecure, black woman, single mother, after my first, after my divorce from my first husband, the fact that I meditated, the fact that I walked, the fact that I was engaged in stillness practices made that experience much more tolerable. Yeah. And so you don't have to be, you know, middle class, upper class, blah, blah, blah. This, these are practices that are important for absolutely anybody and everybody. So, um, and I was very aware of that, you know, not talking to, you know, just certain people. And then when I was a single mother, I started a single parents group. Now this was before the internet. This was back in the days when you had to go to city paper and write a little ad in the paper. I'm looking for other black women who are single mothers and who want to get together in a support group. Okay, just like that. Had my support group in two weeks. And that's how I met my husband. Through that single parents group. 
I was at dinner with a friend of mine who um, had a shirt on. It said, Black Girls Hike. I said, they do? She said, yeah. yeah. So I started with Black Women Hike. There's <laughs> like six or seven of us. And we just walk once a month. Yeah. Okay? And um, then there's a writing group, you know, which, which you're part of. Yeah. And these are all my vitamins. These are my drugs. Mm. All these sisters show the room, these are my drugs, my positive drugs. These are my vitamins that keep me alive. And they also, they, they help us counter these negative narratives that are coming from so many different places. And they help us to create more positive self-talk within. I just want to give like, two really lovely quotes from that last section. Because one is that you say, quote, portals for monologues that inspire us, not dictate to us. That's what we need. And then also, in the book you say, the stories we tell ourselves are a factor in creating the lives we live. And I, I feel like much of, like, I mean, you are a story, and much of what you're telling us is, let's, like, there's these stories that are coming from all of these different places. I mean, and, look, look, I had, I went out last night with one of my, one of the, the boot, one of my booze, yeah. and, the, and the women right here, we went to see the play. So then we went to dinner, and we're talking, and she said, you read it? I decided I'm going to be a millionaire. Okay, so that's who, that, those kind of people I hang out with. She decided that she's going to be a millionaire. She's claimed that. So we just started talking about how she was claiming it and everything. So who are you hanging out with? And what's the same? Yes, but what's the conversation you got to have? And see, I'm 73 years old. Oh. So all of my new friends are young enough to be my daughter. <laughs> yeah. So I want to wrap up here, but before we do, I, I want to end our discussion with a quote from Toni Morrison um, about your book, Saving Our Son. Because I just think it's a, such a beautiful quote because it says so much about you as well. And, and that quote is, it is always heartening to see women step up to the writer's table when the results are as adroit and affecting as Maria Golden's work, it is more than satisfying. It is a cause for celebration. You, Maria Golden, are a cause for celebration. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> and, and I just want to acknowledge another person. I want to acknowledge your mother. Because uh, how, how I met Sadie Wolford that right here. Raise your hand. And these two, you know, women, they're mother-daughter power team, okay? And um, Sadie came into one of my workshops and she was working on a memoir about growing up in North Carolina, you know, growing up poor but full of pride, growing up poor with ambition. And the story was so beautifully written. She, um, she's published a book and a collection of stories. And, um, she, and then, through, then after I worked with her, I met Pamela. And those stories of our elders are so important. And I said, oh my god, this story of growing up in the 1930s, and oh, a young person needs to read this. Yeah. They need to know from whence we came. And I'll end just with this. I was doing a presentation at a bookstore last week, and some young people came into the store. They were not there for me, but they were just browsing. And they heard the conversation we were having, and so two of them came over and sat down. So during the question and answer period, one young man said, you know, I heard this conversation, and I thought it was so important, and I really wanted to listen to it, and I want you you're my, my elders. I want you to tell me, I'm a poet, what can I do, you know, as a writer in terms of systemic racism? So first we said thank you for, for honoring us with your presence. This is a young man whose poetry has been featured at the Smithsonian, who's been honored at the White House, who um, just graduated from Duke Ellington in literary media. And I told him, I said, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. You can't fight anything unless you take care of yourself. Right. And the second thing is as a black, young black person, you have the right to joy. Yes. 
Systemic racism is going to be there. You don't have to worry about that. But you do have to claim every day your joy and your right to joy and, your, and take care of yourself. And we have forgotten that as a really important foundation of living. Take care of yourself. Thank you. You know, how, how, how I met you, how my mother's met you, how different people have met you. And so what do you have upcoming for us in terms of workshops and events? And Okay, well, I, anybody who wants to get on my email list, I do have a, uh, a form you can sign up on. And I, in addition to my writing, I offer writing workshops. I will be doing a webinar for people interested in self-publishing on Thursday, uh, August 3rd. And in the fall, I will be introducing a membership opportunity for people who want to work with me so that you don't have to worry. When's Marina going to offer another class? When? If you join this membership opportunity, you will have access to me regularly. Um, and I don't want to say any more than that, but if you sign up on my email list, you will get that information. And I'm also doing, these two books have really changed my life so much. Um, I'm doing workshops, radical self-healing workshops. I did one at the at Martin Luther King Library. Um, I spoke at HBCUs um, in corporate settings. Everybody's concerned about mental health. So I'm doing a lot of speaking around that as well. Oh, wonderful, a lot to look forward to. And now I'd just like to open it up to the audience if there's any questions. And then um, we have a, a, a microphone in the back, so someone will come to you with a microphone if you can. So if anything, be still, be silent, or am I missing one, Mr. Marie?